Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone joining us today for our last Child Abuse Prevention Month webinar. Today's presentation is focused on the many ways that you can get involved to help our youth and families in Cuyahoga County. You're going to meet several agencies that are making a big difference. Each agency offers opportunities for citizens to volunteer, advocate, support, and donate. If you have always wanted to get involved, but didn't know how or what was out there, after, today, after today's presentation, you'll definitely be equipped to continue to make a difference. The format for today will start with introductions, then a time for each speaker to present their agency and their opportunities, followed at the end by a time for questions and answers. However, if you get a question that pops into your mind and you don't want to forget it, feel free to type it in the chat section or the Q&A section. And once we get to that part of our presentation, we'll make sure to answer it. So last note is that all participants will be muted until the question and answer time. And then that the presentation as stated was being recorded. So I'm gonna get the ball rolling and I'm gonna start by introducing myself. My name is Kristen Gardner and I am the outreach coordinator for Cuyahoga County Division of Children and Family Services. I often tell people that uh, basically our job is, uh, if it's not casework and it's not payment processing, we're probably doing it. So um, that's me. And then next, if Trisha would like to introduce herself. Sure, I'm Trisha. Quavenin, I'm the Executive Director of Child and Family Advocates of Cuyahoga County. We administer the CASA program in Cuyahoga County. Uh, CASA is an acronym for Court Appointed Special Advocate. And uh, these are community-based volunteers that serve kids in the child welfare and juvenile justice system. Okay. And next we have April. Hi everybody, my name is April Rashid. I am Program Director for Cleveland Angels. We are a nonprofit uh, here in Cleveland, also part of a national network in 22 metropolitan cities across the US that are of the National Angels Network. And we are a community wraparound support for any family that is experiencing foster care, foster or kinship families, um, as well as providing mentorship for youth in care ages 11 to 22. Uh, I was also a foster parent for six years and have two um, children adopted out of uh, the foster care system. So very passionate about this and I'm really happy to, um, to speak with y'all today. Thank you, April. Next is Bev. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Beverly Johnson and I'm program coordinator for the Com Community of Hope, which is a nonprofit, nonprofit faith uh, based organization that wraps itself around young people that have aged out of foster care or been touched by foster care. Our responsibility and our mission is to help them from being homeless and to push them forward to self-sufficiency and to hope that, uh, that we can break the cycle of foster care and and also being homeless and jobless. Great, thanks Bev. Last is Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Carter. I'm the Executive Director of Fostering Hope. We're a nonprofit in the Cleveland area serving kids all over Cuyahoga County and from surrounding counties that are in residential treatment and foster care. Awesome, thanks Karen, okay. So thanks for introducing yourselves. That's just to get everyone started. Now we're going to dive deeper into our agencies, what our missions are, the work we do, and how you can get involved. So like before, I'll get the group started. Uh, so here at the Division of Children and Family Services, our mission is to assure that children at risk of abuse and neglect are protected and nurtured within a family and with the support of the community as we strive to end the overrepresentation of people of color in the child welfare system. And we actually, that's a updated version of our mission. We updated it a couple years ago to reflect the passion that we have uh, in combating the racism that's been so prevalent in the child welfare system, not just in our county, but really throughout our whole country. Um, so in general, our, what our agency does is that we are the county system that receives all reports of suspected child abuse or neglect. 
we then investigate those reports and then we work, you know, we either, we work with the family, we work with the court system, we worked with other community agencies to either support and reunify that family or to find a permanent solution for children through the identification of a forever family. Um, obviously you can tell that our, our passion and mission is about, is about uh, our youth and also uh, families uh, to surround that youth. We think that that's kind of where they grow and develop best. Um, currently right now, just to give you an idea of where we're at in our system, we have over 2,500 youth in foster care. Um, we have about another 2,000 or so that we work with in their homes. So that can be through um, uh, court supervision or just, you know, they're in their homes and they are lacking things, you know, that are more resources, um, not necessarily where they're uh, at risk. So, um, you know, in total, we're always working with probably about between four to 6,000 youth uh, total. Uh, but right now there's, like I said, 2,500 in our foster care system. So we're one of the biggest, um, we are probably the biggest county in Ohio that has, um, in terms of our numbers, um, we're not the largest anymore in terms of total population. I think that goes to Franklin County, but we are actually the largest in terms of the numbers in our foster care system. So uh, we and all these agencies definitely have a huge need that we're trying to meet. So um, just to give you an idea of that, um, specifically my department is the outreach department and we work to support our youth, our families and our caseworkers in the really difficult but extremely important work that, that they do and that they go through. Um, so in order to do that, we offer quarterly programs. We do a spring basket program. We do a back to school drive where we give kids um, backpacks full of school supplies and you know resources as they you know kind of get uh, go back to school uh, we do a halloween program usually where we decorate our building um, and then the it's kind of just like a safe trick-or-treat event and then we do obviously a big push around christmas time as well we also offer special programs that happen throughout the year we often we benefit from at least two uh, charity runs that are in the local Cleveland area. And so we're always looking for volunteers to help us staff the registration or the water tables. Um, we also are actually having, um, we are benefiting from a bike fundraiser that is typically done every year through a partnership of some local foster parents, an organization called Together We Rise, and then our organization as well. And so this Saturday we're giving out 139 bikes to kids in our foster care system. So. Um, there's stuff like that where we need, obviously, we need volunteer support to build the bikes. Um, I don't know. I've never built one. So uh, if I were to receive one, I would surely be grateful that someone else had done that for me. Uh, so there's that part of it. Then there's also the um, part of donating the money to purchase the bikes. So they just finished that fundraiser last month and then went through the process of ordering it. And then we're going to, like I said, build them and hand them out this Saturday. We also give out you know, to our kids that come into care, uh, comfort bags, um, just kind of um, various size uh, duffel bags that they can carry their stuff in. I know that lots of people call in, they've heard stories about kids in foster care, getting stuff and, or having their stuff dragged around in trash bags. And that definitely has happened. And it definitely, you know, has been an issue. But I think our community actually has done a really great job of making sure that that doesn't ha have to happen. Um, I think you're always going to run into emergency circumstances where the kids are leaving the house right then and there. They're not going to have time to come back to our building to grab a bag. So in that moment, stuff might get scooped up in a, into a trash bag. But when they get here, they, they are given a bag. So, um, But we work with a few different local organizations. One of them is Fostering Hope. And uh, they help us provide those bags for the kids. And then it's usually filled with goodies for them, you know, stuff that they can call their own in case they weren't able to leave home with anything. Uh, we tried to sell some other special programs that we get support for or need support for from our community, things like summer camps, uh, experiences, that's kind of like tickets to games, events, plays, stuff like that. So there's all different sorts of ways that people can, you know, support our youth and our families uh, through those uh, programs. We also do general donations throughout the year. We're always, I mean, obviously we work with 
like I said, between four to 6,000 kids. So we're always in need of, you know, just about anything you can think of that a kid would need, which is, you know, everything. Um, from car seats to strollers to cribs and pack and plays, we do get a lot of little ones. Um, if anyone's ever had a baby, they're really hard. So we often get a lot of babies and we need a lot of baby stuff. So, um, and then things like, and then we have a lot of older youth as well. So then we need clothing, not just for our little ones, but we need clothing for people that are bigger than me, you know, so that are, you know, really f almost full grown or more than full grown adults. Um, and we take in gift cards that we like to give, especially to our teens. They're not so much into toys. You know, I, I know a lot of people when they think of us uh, in terms of giving stuff out, you know, they think of toys and stuff, but uh, a lot of our kids are in the, you know, they, they want to do their own shopping or they want to, you know, that kind of freedom um, that that like a gift card can give them. Um, we have a, another partnership with a group based out of Texas actually called uh, Undies for Everyone. So one of the things that we often need that kids always need and they need brand new is underwear. Um, and so we have been um, uh, lucky to receive two shipments from them over the past two years. Um, to provide, basically provide seven pairs of underwear for just about every kid that we're working with. So uh, we're working with a plan on how to get those out to our kids, but also to have them on hand for when they do come into care. Uh, we always in need of, you know, socks, shoes, things like that. Um, I kind of sum it up that basically if a youth has a material need, we try to meet it or figure out how to make it happen. Um, it's often in the spur of the moment, like it's literally a, a caseworker and a kid knocking at our door and they moved here from Florida or somewhere else and they need a winter coat. Um, and while we do have funds available, you know, from the state that do help us, you know, foster parents and stuff, purchase that, as April can attest, when you're waiting on a purchase order, that doesn't help a kid that needs a winter coat today. So uh, we like to have stuff on hand and uh, we've been doing this now for about eight years. Uh, so we're we're pretty new to this, you know, our, our agency is uh, pretty new to this work. Um, a county like Franklin County has had this department around, like my department, for over 50 years now. So they're really established in, in what they do. And so we're, um, we're kind of in the, you know, new beginning stages compared to that. But um, I think we, you know, we tend to know what we're going to get asked for. And we try to have that on hand or at least have a way to get it to, you know, our kids and families. Um, we like to communicate with our donors and our past supporters. We use email, we use social media, we use our website. That's really the easiest way for people to find out about our opportunities and our special requests throughout the year. Um, and then, so that's all kind of like our donation stuff. Our volunteers, like I said, being a newer kind of program, we do have opportunities, but they're a little more sporadic. Uh, some of our partner agencies that are uh, that you'll hear from today have more like ongoing opportunities. So if that's what you're interested in, I, I always direct people to one of them because ours tend to be organized around those uh, quarterly programs, those special programs. So obviously things like this Saturday, we need help building bikes, but that's a one-time thing, uh, you know, in the year, um, uh, filling backpacks you know, that could be like your group could do that at your church or at your school or, you know, whatever. But, um, but that, but we do, um, we do offer opportunities for volunteers to do that. It's just, like I said, it's not as um, consistent. Uh, so if that's a better fit for your group. Definitely get in touch with me. You know, we'd love to talk with you about that. Um, the only thing is we don't have a lengthy process. There is an application for every volunteer that we ask them to fill out. Um, but if you are going to be at an event, like, because we do have some volunteers that like to support our events, um, any volunteer that would come in contact with one of our youth has to go through our background check process. Um, it doesn't cost you anything. It's totally free. We cover the cost, but it does take your time. So it, it costs your time to set up the appointment, to come down to our building, to get it done, and then to wait for the, wait results, the results, which are starting to get better at coming back, but it has kind of taken a little bit longer than it used to um, since COVID and everything. But um, that's kind of a summary of, of our agency, of what we do, of what we need. Um, and so right now I'm gonna turn it back over to Trisha to talk about her agency. And you can go to the next slide, Ricky. 
Yes, hi again, everyone. Um, I'm here on behalf of Child and Family Advocates of Cuyahoga County. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, that came to the county in 2016. Um, CASA is actually a national program. The National CASA GAL Association is in Washington State. And the first CASA program started in the late 70s. So uh, there are over a thousand CASA programs now in 49 states. Um, we do have that national office that provides us with a lot of standards and best practices um, and our, we really function as a chapter of that organization. So our mission is um, to provide highly qualified and trained advocates to come along children uh, that are in the foster care system. Um, these advocates are working on behalf of children, serving as their voice uh, helping to provide recommendations to the juvenile court as far as what may be in their best interests. Um, we serve children birth to 19 that are at risk for abuse, neglect, dependency, and who are also what we say at risk of aging out of the foster care system without ever achieving permanency. Um, we do collaborate with a lot of agencies, primarily the juvenile court and children's services, but also other child welfare agencies. And like um, the Division of Children and Family Services, our main goals are to help children be safe, to ensure that children have the resources they need for healthy development, and to ultimately help them achieve permanency. CASA volunteers are people from all walks of life who um, come alongside a child and serve as their advocates. So we have people that are just out of college. We have people that are middle-aged professionals. We have a lot of older people um, because they have the time. Um, they're no longer working. We have a lot of people from the helping professions. They tend to gravitate to this kind of volunteer opportunities. So we have retired nurses, retired school teachers, um, social workers, but we really do have people from all walks of life. Um, to be a CASA volunteer, you have to be uh, age 21 and up. You have to be able to pass a background check, um, go through an application interview process, and then a 30 hour training program. Um, the training involves 10 hours of independent study or what we call pre-work, which uh, takes you through some self-assessments and understanding your own motivations for wanting to be a CASA volunteer. Then we move into the actual classroom training, which is more about specific topics, um, how to work with children that are at risk for abuse, neglect, and dependency, um, learning more about topics that affect children like substance abuse, domestic violence, mental health, um, education, and so on. So our, our goal is really to provide a highly trained uh, volunteer who can be effective as a child's advocate. Um, we have trained over 100 volunteers, CASA volunteers, since we started in 2016. Um, we have about 83 active volunteers right now, and we serve about 100 children a year. So we should hit the 700, uh, 700th child served uh, sometime in 2022. We're pretty proud of that. Uh, we're always looking for more CASA volunteers. Ideally, every child that's in the child welfare system in our county should have a CASA um, would essentially be eligible to have a CASA on their case. Um, some of our other cities here in the United States have 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 CASAs uh, where their programs have been well established, sometimes for decades. Um, we think having five or 600 CASA volunteers would be about right for a, or a city our size. And so we have uh, some room to grow there as far as scaling and getting more CASA volunteers. And that's really one of the main goals of our program right now is to scale, to get more people. Um, as far as partners, I indicated earlier, our main partners are the Juvenile Court and Children and Family Services, but also a lot of other child welfare partners like Adoption Network. Um, the Ohio Attorney General's Office is a partner because we are funded in part by the VOCA uh, program, Victims of Crime Act. Um, every child that's abused or neglected by their parents is considered a victim of a crime, and that's why we are able to get uh, funding from these crime victims programs. We also partner with agencies like Adoption Network, um, other child welfare providers, local businesses. Um, we have some really terrific support from companies as well as foundations, Cleveland Foundation, Pruning, Gun Foundation. They're all um, participants with us in the CASA mission and consider them partners. Additionally, we look at individuals as partners. Um, you can sponsor a CASA for $1,200 a year. Uh, it costs about $100 a month to support one CASA volunteer. And we do have quite a few donors um, right now who are supporting us primarily in that way. They give $1,200 a year to, to essentially be responsible for supporting one CASA volunteer 
And so we're always looking for new partners and invite people to consider being a partner. Uh, something unique to us is a scholarship fund that we started um, last year. We had a very um, prominent CASTA volunteer who was also a board member and um, retired uh, United Parcel Service executive who served with us for many years, was an active CASA volunteer both in Chicago and Cuyahoga County, um, served over 20 children, uh, primarily teens, and was in touch with many of them, sometimes years after he had been their CASA volunteer, um, Kevin O'Boyle. And he uh, sadly passed away two summers ago, June of 2020, uh, very unexpectedly. And so in his honor, we've started the Kevin O'Boyle Scholarship Fund this is a fund for uh, former foster youth who are attending uh, college, either four-year college or two-year associate degree programs or um, technical or trade programs that could be certificate-based uh, to help them fund their education. Uh, there is a lot of support for former foster youth through Bridges and other programs for college. Additionally, a lot of the colleges and universities here have their own scholarship funds for foster youth. Um, but we wanted to honor Kevin's legacy, and uh, because he primarily served teens and older youth, we thought the scholarship fund would be a great way to do that. So we can accept donations to that scholarship fund, and people can find out more about that on our website. The scholarship application cycle is also open for the fall of 2022, so if anyone knows any former foster youth that are planning to attend college or who are college students now, they could refer them to our scholarship for for funding for their college degree program. Um, like most nonprofits, we have a board of directors. We would currently have 18 members of that board, um, always looking for additional people to serve um, and get involved with uh, CASA and the youth that are being served by CASA. It's a really terrific opportunity um, to have a professional volunteer opportunity. If you can't be a CASA volunteer, serving on the board could be something that you could do in a way that you could contribute. And then we've just started what we're calling a Young Professionals Board. A lot of nonprofits are starting these now, a way to get people more in that 20 to 30 age demographic involved with us. Again, maybe someone who doesn't have time to be a CASA volunteer or wouldn't quite want to take that on, but is interested in the mission of CASA. They can apply to serve on the Young Professionals Board. Uh, the application for that is on our website, and it's designed for college graduates, basically uh, 21 to 35, uh, to serve with us. We would consider this a stepping stone to the full board, that the governing board of the organization. Um, but this would be uh, primarily a, a volunteer uh, opportunity to help us with events, with outreach and marketing and things like that. Um, the only other thing I would mention is donating. Like, like any other nonprofit, um, we are soliciting contributions from the public, people that are interested in the past mission, um, someone to serve as an advocate for a child in the system. We accept those donations over our website and you can go to um, cfadvocates.org to learn more about how to donate. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you. Thanks, Tricia. We are going to go to um, our next presenter, which is April. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you for, for including Cleveland Angels in this discussion today. So as I said, we are a nonprofit uh, here locally that works to wrap community support around any family who has an active foster placement, including, um, you know, a kinship situation where maybe a relative or a friend has taken in um, you know, children unexpectedly. So, you know, sometimes when you're becoming a, a foster parent, you have done the pre-service classes and you are totally prepared and you've had your home study and you're ready to go. Um, sometimes, you know, in those kinship situations, they're opening their, their homes and their hearts um, on, you know, a few hours notice. And so what we do at Cleveland Angels is really to bring community members who care, who want to have a meaningful volunteer experience who want to kind of dig deep on the relational side of things. And we can connect them with a family or a youth in care that is in need of support. So we have, um, you know, basically we serve any child, youth or family in the foster care system almost at any step. So, um, 
on three pillars that underlie both of our programs and you can see them listed there. We have the Love Box program, which is a holistic foster family support. And we have the Dare to Dream program, which is a one-on-one -on -one mentorship uh, for any youth in care that's ages 11 to 22. And families can be, you know, in both of these programs at the same time as well. So I'll, I'll explain how that works. Mm -hmm. um, but the three pillars that underlie both of these programs for us that we see as so important are intentional giving. So that's the giving of thoughtful resources. It can be the giving of time and energy as well. So for us, when we're matching up a group of volunteers in one community with a local foster family, we're, we're doing that match very intentionally to say like, all right, this, this group of volunteers has stepped up to work together. Maybe it's a book club or a husband and wife and kids, um, a group of friends, and they say, wow, we want to we wanna work together to make a difference for a family who's you know fostering. We'll look at the families in the area uh, within a 20 minute drive typically um, to keep that support close and to make it easy for everybody. And we'll look at the family's needs. Okay, um, this group has time and uh, wants to really, you know, take kids out and give them enrichment activities they might not always have access to otherwise. We'll look for a family that's in need of that. Um, maybe it's, you know, grandma has five kids and she's not got the financial resource or the, or the time or energy to take the you know, kids out and, and the love box group would come alongside her and, and take them for the afternoon and give them that experience and give her a bit of a, you know, a few hours rest. We look at each family, we talk to them like about their circumstances and what is really going to be helpful to you. So that's the intentional giving piece. And then the other two are relational, re, I'm sorry, relationship building so we want someone to come into the home who's ready to commit time and energy and give of themselves to really invest in a child's interests in who they are. Um, you know, we really believe that every child deserves to have people in their lives who, you know, know the color of their eyes and know the passions of their heart and want to help them build confidence in themselves. And so that's the relationship building piece. Um, and for caregivers, you know, sometimes it's just they're meeting a friend. Um, I can speak from personal experience as a foster parent. This system is big and complicated. And I, I think everyone on this call, even, you know, those of us that work in it, especially to say it's, it's big and complicated and to navigate that can be really hard. Um, and it's nice to have someone from the community who's coming in to say like, I don't work for an agency. I have no you know, skin in this game. I'm just here for you. I wanna support you as a caregiver. Um, and so what that does is it supports placement stability for kids because foster parents are less likely to throw their hands up and say, "What? wow, this is more than I thought, or this is different than I thought, and I don't think I can do this anymore. And then kids are moving again and they're having another layer of trauma, um, unfortunately, that is befalling them. So we really look to um, provide like consistent, healthy, stable adults um, in the homes for, for these caregivers and kids. Um, the third pillar is mentorship. And so of course, Dare to Dream, you would think of like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, that's a mentorship program. Um, but also within our, our foster family support program wraparound, we expect and, and hope that the volunteers that are coming in building relationships will become mentors in a sense to those kids. Um, and if you were interested in learning more about that program, I mean, please reach out to us. Uh, we have four case managers that work with families here in the local area, myself and three others. And we would be happy to walk you through all the details about the matching process and how all of that works. Um, one wonderful thing I think about our programs is that you can do it with your children or your grandchildren. Um, kids can be involved. And I did that with my family, my husband and I, um, we have four kids and we became a love box group and we matched with a family that was nearby that was fostering and our kids became friends. And it creates that normalcy too for kids in care that they're not feeling so othered um, all the time, you know, that's a quote unquote foster kid. We, you know, they have that already that sense of like, I'm different um, and that affects them, you know, their confidence, their self-worth, all of those things. So we're looking to promote normalcy. Um, and we have what we hope will be lifelong friends now um, out of that, that experience, even though our stint in the program is over because um, the, the children in the home happen to be adopted. Um, 
so there's a lot that goes into why, you know, why do we lean on these three pillars? Um, our programs are based on Karen Purvis's research out of her institute in Texas. Um, it's called TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Intervention. And, and what that research shows is that for kids who have gone through, you know, trauma, which anyone who's, who's ending up, you know, being removed from home has experienced a trauma of the loss of their, you know, closest relationships, um, and that trust has been broken, the only thing that can begin to heal that for a child is to, to have someone consistently modeling what a healthy attachment and relationship does look like. So th that's what we're looking for. We're looking for community members who maybe, you know, have an interest in fostering or, um, you know, maybe they're not going to be a foster parent or it's not the right time in their life, or maybe they're wanting to learn more about what that would be like, but um, someone who really wants to invest some time and, and really have a uh, build relationship with kids. So our, our, other kind of goal is to create a sense of community among families that foster. So we, you know, we think of Cleveland Angels families as a community. Um, we like to bring our volunteers and their families together with our the families in our programs. Um, we do a big community picnic um, in the summertime and have everyone come out together. And again, it's that normalcy piece. You don't have people looking, you know, at you thinking like, wow, your family looks different than mine or asking, you know, insensitive questions. It's just everyone's there together. Um, having a wonderful time in creating that community. And that's really important to us uh, as an organization. So, you know, we as case managers at Cleveland Angels work with any volunteer that steps forward, we would just speak with you and say like, all right, tell, tell me why you're interested in getting involved. And we can kind of suss out together, um, you know, what experience would be right for you. And we have room for people from all walks of life here. So, you know, sometimes, it's, you know, we have some like young professionals, we have people in retirement age, we have families that do this together. So, you know, if it's sparking an interest in you and you want to know more, just please um, hop on our website, which is cleangels.org and read a little bit and reach out and I would love to walk you through it. Um, and, and what we see too from, from having these programs operate in other cities, you know, maybe a little bit longer than we had them here in Cleveland, as we've been able to have some evidence-based research done and some data to back up what we were seeing anecdotally as outcomes, which were, wow, it seems like, you know, um, in Austin, Texas, where our, our programs began and they've been going on since 2017, the high school graduation rate is a lot higher for kids that are in this Dare to Dream program than kids who are not. So 50% versus 100% graduating high school. And we were thinking this is great, but we knew that we needed to have those outcomes, um, you know, researched. And so we worked with the University of Texas last year in 2021, and they did um, spend the year interviewing participants from the past five years of programs in Austin. And we were so excited and it's been so validating to see that our programs are achieving relational permanency. So people coming into those kids' lives and they're still in their lives years later after the program is over. Um, it, it, we are meeting important needs for families in the moment. Um, and we are creating normalcy for kids. And the results of that research is on our website if you'd like to, to go in and see a little bit more, learn a little bit more about that. Um, so all of that's really exciting for us. This program model is working. Um, we're growing nationally really fast and we're growing here in Cleveland really fast. So we've got two new case managers that came on who have room on their caseloads to match people up right now. Um, so, you know, you can apply to be a volunteer on our website. It's very easy, it's a short little form. It comes straight um, through to me and we would just give you a call and, and start a conversation and get you started and, and walk you through the process. So um, check out our, our social media and our website uh, for more info and feel free to you know reach out. And I thank you for, for listening to everything. And we're really, really excited to see how we can come together to serve these kids in our community. Great, thanks so much, April. Uh, next, we have uh, Bev from Community of Hope. Next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting Community of Hope. Community of Hope started out of a need uh, for young people that were aging out of foster care that had no safety net or any, anyone to undergird them as they uh, struck out on a new journey in life. 
uh, what we did about uh, seven years ago, we started Community of Hope. And what Community Hope does, it creates communities for young people so that, to wrap themselves around them so that they will have somebody to walk with them and help them navigate life. Uh, most of them have not been nurtured or nourished. So they need those, they don't lack those life skills that help a person when they're trying to approach adulthood. We, uh, as they age out of foster care between the age of 18 and 21, uh, we get volunteers to wrap themselves around them and walk with them. We don't call it a program because our young people don't like the name program. They like the idea of an organization because they said in foster care, you get kicked out of programs. And we want them to know that this is an organization that they don't ever have to worry about being kicked out. In our organization, as we create these communities, we give them a sense of belonging. We give them a voice. We give them that dignity or restore that dignity that they lost during the time that they were in foster care or during that time that the trauma occurred in their life. So what happens in our communities, we get volunteers, usually it's like three to four people that wrap themselves around these young people and help them walk through life. They undergird them and keep them from falling into homelessness. They undergird them and show them how to navigate life in terms of going grocery shopping, in terms of getting their driver's license, in terms of getting a FAFSA to try to go to college. We try to uh, unite them with people that have like minds. We allow them to pick their own volunteers. Uh, we have a pool of volunteers that we pick from. We allow them to pick their own volunteers and they look at the volunteers' application and they pick the person that has gone through something uh, related to what they've gone through or is this maybe a particular app a profession or life skill that they are trying to uh, acquire, that person can help them with that. So our volunteers bring a, a multiplicity of networking resources and experiences to, to uh, the table. So when the young person picks these people, they pick them for that reason and the person wraps themselves around that young person, give them that sense of belonging, create that relational uh, relationship that they've not had before. So our whole objective is not to go from relationship to community and from community to family. We want them to have that family-like environment that they've never experienced before. And so that's what we do with our young people. We get our young people from a vast number of different places. We get them from uh, DCFS. We get them from the YWCA, we get them from uh, Fill This House, we get them from other organizations, uh, Beachwood, uh, all those places we get the young people from. And we make sure that the young person's ready to have people in their lives because they've had people in their lives all ever since they've been in foster care. So a lot of them don't want people in their lives anymore. So we take them to a training program, make sure that they're ready to have people in their lives, make sure that they're stably housed, working or in school or both, go headed towards self-sufficiency. That's one of our criteria. Uh, we just don't take everybody that ages out of foster care because we want them to be ready. We want don't want them to we don't want to set them up for failure and we don't want the community to fail. So they have to be stably housed in school, working or both or headed toward that direction. The community comes along aside them and un, uh, goes and undergirds them and pushes them towards success and propels them toward self-sufficiency. So what our communities do, they not only teach them life skills, they also teach them things that they've never experienced before fun things. Some of our young people have never had a birthday party at 25 years old. Some of our young people have never been exposed to how to actually grocery shop or been to a museum or been to a theater. So they expose them to the things that they've not had in life that most of them have had growing up in a family. And because they've not had the family-like experience, these things are new to them. They're exciting to them. And, uh, and we have great success. At present time, we have 77 communities. We have over 400 volunteers. The good thing about our organization is we don't go away. It's not for a year, it's for a lifetime. Our oldest community at this point is eight years old. So the young person becomes part of their family. They have somewhere to go with Thanksgiving. They have somebody to share with Christmas. They have somebody to share their birthdays. They have somebody to talk to when they're going through crisis. They have somebody to be there for them when they experience any downfall in life. We want to uh, help it, let them know that we, unlike everybody else, are not going to abandon them. We're not going to leave them, but we're going to be there for them. 
We have a trauma-informed organization where we address their trauma that they've, they've experienced during their time in foster care or just a, the disconnection of losing their family for whatever the reason was. Uh, we just do all these things. We take the young people through a training. We take the uh, community uh, to a, through a training. And the training consists of six hours. And during the training for the volunteers, that training consists of uh, letting them know what they're going to be exposed to, that, that they're not their children, that they're, they're not their parents. You're not there to parent them, but you're there to walk alongside them and help guide, direct, and, and nurture them towards success. Uh, the young person is like at the helm of the ship. They're running it, and the uh, volunteers only go as fast as the young person goes. We tell them all the time, this is not a, a sprint, this is a, a marathon. So you have to take it slow. It's a slow journey walk because the young person is learning and they're learning how to be adults. And that's not an easy chore. Uh, our mission is to, to nurture hope and to restore that dignity by creating that family-like relationship. We want to give them that sense of belonging that they've never had before. So we, uh, our volunteers just go on our website. We get volunteers from, like everyone else said, from every walk of life, uh, from different experiences, different backgrounds, uh, different ethnicities. We have all kinds of people that come and volunteer and they want to walk alongside some a young person and change their lives. Our volunteers pay, Volunteers pay $120 uh, one-time fee to become part of uh, our organization. And that's just for their background check, their t-shirts, but most of all, it's for our young people because our young people are so impressed with the fact that somebody thought enough of them to invest in their lives. That's the, like, that's the changer for our young people. You mean somebody thought that I was worth investing in? You thought somebody, was it, somebody thought I was important enough to pour into that my life may change? That's a game changer for our young people and it propels them to come. And they, once they get in, it's, it's a scary situation because they're tired of people being in their lives. But once they realize the people are not there to treat them like a project, but to treat them like they're an individual, that they're a human being, and that they want to help them uh, go towards success. And they want to help them be more than their last generation. They want to help them break that generational cycle. They want to help them achieve the goals and objectives that they only thought of. So we want to change their, their, their uh, capital their social capital and broaden their horizons so that they can have a better in, insight on life and they can have a better outlook on life. Uh, we do this with passion. We don't consider this a job. There's no time. We're here from sunrise. We've been going to the hospital. We've given help and given birth to babies. We do any number of things. We want our young people to know, and they do know that we're there for them regardless of circumstances. So what we also do is uh, we take donations too, whether it be gift cards, bus tickets, um, gas cards, whatever the case may be, we're always looking for opportunities and we're looking uh, for people to uh, engage in. And we're also looking for people to engage in volunteering. We don't ever have enough volunteers. We don't ever have enough people to wrap ourselves around these young people that are aging out of foster care and have no direction and have no safety net. So our age uh, is from 18 to 30. Our oldest person is 30. And uh, most of our young people are just uh, prospering and, and they're just thriving. And, and we all know that they're resilient because they overcome so many difficulties and challenges, but they're resilient, but they're resilient in the fact that they know that they have somebody standing with them and standing uh, beside them and standing behind them to push them and propel them into what they want to do. So we love our organization and we love the people that volunteer and we're just continuing looking for uh, volunteers that don't want to foster, but they want to help a young person get to the next level of their life. They want to help a young person change their life. They want to take some of the expertise that they have and pour into another young person to make that person become all that they can be. So if we're looking for volunteers, they can go on our website, www hope cleave and fill out the application, do the background check. Our young people go through a, back, uh, a drug test and a background check also. So we train the young people as well as the, uh, the volunteers. So they both go in and knowing what to expect of each other. Uh, it creates new friendships. 
Uh, not only with our young person, it's a win-win situation because volunteers come in and they meet people from all ethnic backgrounds and they become friends and they become lifelong friends. So the young person has a family and the volunteers have friends that they may never have encountered had they not decided to step outside of that box. So if you're interested, please go to our website and just uh, fill out the application and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And we look forward to working with you and we look forward to you journeying with us. Awesome, thank you so much, Bev. And now for our last presenter, it's uh, Karen from Fostering Hope. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Fostering Hope was founded uh, over seven years ago, really to address the unique experiences that children and youth face in the foster care system, um, including the issues that they, they face of physical and behavioral concerns, poor self-esteem, and an overriding sense of loss of a typical childhood. Um, our mission is to connect and enrich youth in foster care and residential treatment through unique experiences of hope and healing to help them to surmount those issues that they, they face. Um, we achieve this through our nine programs that fall into three pillars, typical childhood experiences, health and wellness, and community engagement. Uh, our typical childhood experiences include things like holiday celebrations, birthday programming, and um, our journey bag program that Kristen alluded to earlier, talking about the need for comfort bags for children as they enter foster care or change placements in foster care. Um, these programs all rely on in-kind donations and really look to address um, the fact that kids in foster care have missed out on some of those experiences that we would expect every child or hope every child would have. Um, somebody to, to buy them a birthday gift or celebrate their birthday. Um, Beth mentioned that some of their young people uh, have never had anybody celebrate their birthday. Our hope at Fostering Hope is that by the time they get to Community of Hope in a few years, you know, that we can change that. So Community of Hope no longer hears from their young people that no one celebrated their birthday when they were a child. So we do birthday boxes um, that the county uh, ships to young people that have, that are in their care. Then in these birthday boxes, there are um, birthday banners and birthday treats. We also um, fulfill birthday wish lists for children in living in residential treatment facilities and foster homes to just ensure that they know that they're valued on their birthday and that people care about them. Um, in addition, we do the Journey Bag Program, which is uh, the program that gets the comfort bags into the hands of kids as they enter foster care. So they are new duffel bags filled with toiletry items, and uh, comfort items, things like stuffed animals, blankets, all new items so that, uh, again, just to ease that transition and to show, give the children some dignity or children and youth dignity as they are going through the process of being placed in um, a foster home, which can be a scary process to, for a young person to go through and traumatic for them. And we wanna ease that so that if they are, when they're in that new home, if they need a toothbrush or they need deodorant, um, they don't even have to ask for it. It's there for them um, as they're getting comfortable with that uh, new family and um, the parents in the home. Uh, in addition to our typical childhood experiences, we have health and wellness programs. These are our pro uh, programs for our um, trauma trained professionals who uh, help youth heal through therapeutic yoga, art and gardening. Uh, we find these are experiences that provide unique uh, healing experiences to children who face complex trauma. And uh, we provide these through residential treatment facilities and to children in foster care as well. Uh, and then we also do summer camp programs under health and wellness. So we look at therapeutic um, horseback riding camps and some outdoor programs, including a week long day camp that is also focused on providing kids um, opportunities to, to heal and grow through uh, summer camp. And then our community engagement pillar um, is our dreams program and our extreme hope makeovers that we provide for young adults and foster families. Uh, the dreams program is for youth 14 and up who have had a residential treatment experience. Um, many of our youth who are in residential treatment when they move on uh, either to a foster home placement or kinship care, 
we want to continue to provide healing experiences to them. They've built a relationship with Fostering Hope in residential, and we don't want that to um, end. If you, as you've heard from um, all the presenters today, relationships are really important for our youth, and uh, positive, ongoing relationships are really important to them. And so we uh, stay in, in touch with them once they've left residential treatment and connect them to uh, mentoring adults through and experiences that many of them have missed out on, such as you know simple things like going bowling, going to a movie, going to a sports game um, with mentoring adults to help them to just continue to heal even beyond their experience in residential treatment. Um, and community engagement really also weaves through typical childhood experiences and health and wellness programs because we, all of these programs rely uh, extensively on volunteers. Uh, so these are the, and one of the opportunities that you can get involved with us, um, we have volunteer opportunities in our donation center weekly. Um, we currently have three days a week that you can sign up to help out in our donation um, center. This includes sorting items uh, for journey bags, packing journey bags, sorting the items for the birthday boxes, and getting birthday boxes ready so that they can be delivered to DCFS to be shipped out to the children um, in time for their birthday. And then seasonally, we need uh, volunteers at the donation center to help with um, our holiday programs, the bunny hop, our gift and greet program that bring um, holiday celebrations to kids in residential treatment and foster care. Um, so there's many opportunities for individuals, families, companies to get involved at in our donation center. And then we also have opportunities within health and wellness. We have three therapeutic gardens um, that we are right now getting ready to um, prepare for summer planting. So we uh, rely on volunteer groups um, or individuals to come out and clean up those gardens and get them ready for the kids to experience therapeutic gardening all summer long. And then we'll also be looking for volunteers in the fall to come back out and do our fall cleanup in those gardens. Um, so all of these are volunteer opportunities. You can look up on our website and sign up. You can fill out a form if you are interested in being a volunteer with us and we will, with your different volunteer interests, whether it's you wanna work um, with our dreams program and attend outings with our young people, or if you would like to do um, volunteering in our donation center, you can list all of your interests and we'll be in touch with you to make sure you, we get you connected to the right programs for you. Um, we also rely on donations. Right now, our biggest needs are for our journey bags. These journey bags are geared for youth everywhere from infancy up through teens. Um, so we have specific bags that we um, give to counties that can go to the infants when they are first placed. And we are in need of diapers and onesies and other things, all new. Again, we only do new items. Um, and you can go on our website and look at our Amazon wish list to see what items our journey bags need. Those come to um, to us right at the at the donation center and then get sorted and um, organized so that they're geared toward their appropriate ages and then given to, to DCFS and also Metro Health. We also distribute those through Metro Health. Um, and then we are always in need of general support for all of our programs. Um, just to give you an idea for the journey bags, $170 covers um, a journey bag and all of the items that go inside of it. And $60 um, fulfills a birthday wish list for a child. Um, and they, and we do uh, wish lists specifically for kids in residential treatment and in some foster homes. And again, this is, we know it's important for kids to be able to ask for what they want. Many of our kids don't have never experienced that when they're first asked, what would you wish for? They may say things simply like, you know, clothes or shoes or really basic items. And we encourage them to even think beyond that. Who do you want to be? What kind of um, activities do you really enjoy? Uh, one year we had a 16 year old who after some conversation, he asked for a viola because he'd always wanted to learn how to play the viola and we were able to match him and fulfill that wish for him. So we, our birthday um, wish list program and our gift and greet when we ask the kids for uh, um, what they wish for are really important to helping kids um, think about who they want to be and, and know and then be validated in the fact that people care. Um, so his ability to then get that viola and get viola lessons was really important for him. Um, to see that, that there were people who cared that that was a, a dream that he had and things that he was able to do. So $60 helps us to fulfill the birthday, the birthday wishes. And all of this, again, on, on our website, fosteringhopeohio.org, you can find our volunteer page, our giving page with the in-kind um, donations. 
Great. Thanks so much, Karen. Thanks to all of our speakers and presenters from our different agencies. So now, if there's anyone on that has a question, you can either unmute yourself or you can type it in the Q&A or in the chat. We'll give just like a minute or two to see if anyone has something. So we'll go ahead and move on. We're just going to end the presentation for today. Just want to thank everyone that was able to join us and thank our presenters as well. We will be sharing out after the presentation. Uh, this will, We'll have a link to this if you ever want to reference it. Also, we'll be able to share uh, websites and you know anything else from the agencies that you'd like me to share out. I'm happy to include that in our follow-up email so people have our information, our contact information, where to find us on the web, where to find us on social media, things like that to make it a little easier for everyone. So um, thank you again, everyone, for your time. Thanks for sharing with us what you do. It's all we I think we're all working together. Really great to do uh, wonderful uh, work for our kids and our uh, families in our community. And I just appreciate each and every one of you. So hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. <laughs>